So next up now, we've got um, Ken Doig. And Ken is a software architect who made the move a few years ago from industry into academia, to research. And he's now currently doing a PhD at the Peter McCallum Cancer Center. And today, he's going to talk about what he's been doing in the pathology area. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, I'd like to endorse Dave Powell, and we don't support Internet Explorer either. <laughs> Just so no. Um, so, okay, I'm a, um, uh, a software engineer by, by training and background, and then I moved into bioinformatics and did a, a master's in uh, microbiology with, um, with Torsten, who's going to um, speak later. And, um, and then um, I've moved to the Peter McCallum Cancer Institute um, because um, cancer sounded interesting and how hard can it be? So that's what I'm, uh, just give you a bit of a background on, on pathology and, and cancer. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Pathos, which is a, a system um, I started off prototyping and then um, we now use uh, for day-to-day -day, uh, clinical diagnostics at Peter Mac. Um, and then I'll just uh, inflict you with some software principles that have come out of my uh, development experience. Um, so, just a bit of context. Um, um, the body is a cooperating system of cells. Um, you've got billions of cells making up your body. Um, when that co cooperation breaks down, um, the cells can start competing with each other, and so they uh, compete for resources within the body, such as energy, uh, blood, um, and so on. Uh, and oxygen, and then Darwinian selection takes place, and those cells um, um, try and outgrow each other. And really, that's what cancer is, essentially. So at Peter Mac, um, I'm in the molecular pathology department, but I also do bioinformatics as well. Um, we provide pathology services to um, patients within the hospital and also external labs all over Australia. So what that means is that these pathology labs send us blood samples and tissue samples, um, tumor tissue samples. We sequence the DNA, um, looking for gene um, mutations. Um, and then uh, if we find anything, we report that in a pathology report, which we send back to the lab. So um, we've had some very good introductions about what we're looking for. Um, but conceptually, it's really, you've got three and a half billion bases of um, a, T, C's and G's within um, uh, every cell in your body. And we're looking for the changes in some of those bases where uh, anything as much as just a single base might have changed in a way that we recognize as being something that we can um, deal with uh, with a therapy. So one way of looking at how that works is as you go through life, um, well, first of all, you have um, all the cells in your body uh, grow out of a, a single cell, um, or two cells really, um, when you're born, or when you're, when you're uh, conceived rather. Um, and then over your lifetime, they expand, um, and some of those cells, um, well, those cells are duplicating all the time, and some of those duplications have errors or mistakes, and they're called mutations, um, and they're called somatic mutations if they happen during your lifetime. Um, the mutations that happen um, before you're born, as in you get from your mother or your father, they're germline mutations. So what happens in cancer is that these mutations sometimes give the cell uh, an advantage over its neighboring cells and they grow out of control. Um, you might have, um, uh, go to a doctor and they might give you some therapy, some drugs or chemotherapy, um, and that might get rid of the cancer altogether. Um, or possibly one of those cells turns out to be resistant to that particular therapy and then it, it can then take off again. But it's not the same as the original tumor. It might be completely different. And so we're not just looking for simple changes. There's actually a whole set of changes and these changes can be clonal. So particular um, uh, in the top right, for example, um, you can see there's two major clones um, with different mutations driving those particular clones. 
Um, and then after a therapy, there's a relapse for the patient, that is that they, um, uh, they get sick again. Um, and that might be uh, caused by one of those clones then uh, growing out, but the other one being um, uh, removed by the therapy. Um, and if you look at this in even more detail, which is what the um, right-hand panel is showing you, um, you can see that there's all sorts of uh, more complex stuff going on if you look at it in, in, in greater detail. Um, and really, it, it all comes down to cost. To do the sort of sequencing that's on the right-hand side, that's many, many thousands of dollars and not, not clinically viable at the moment. Um, but it will be within, within a few years because this stuff is changing so, so fast. So as an example of um, uh, what a mutation is, um, as we've said, as um, Harriet said, it's a, it's a spelling mistake. Um, so in the, the, the center there, uh, a C is changed to a, to a T. Um, but then you might have other sorts of mutations such as um, extra bases being added, like two A's have been added for the insertion on the, the left and on the right. Um, you've got a, a C and a T being uh, removed. Um, and there's other sorts of mutations where uh, there's extra copies of parts of the genome or the genome gets rearranged in a very large scale sort of way. And it's, um, it's a bit more subtle than that as well because if you look at the, the deletion there, um, is it the, C and, the first C and T that's been deleted or the second C and T that's been deleted or is it actually the T and the C that have been deleted because they all actually end up with the, exactly the same result but they can all be described differently. So one of the things we've got to do as bioinformaticians is normalize the way we describe those variants so that we can compare them with other external databases and we don't have to compare all the different ways and combinations that we could represent that. So I work in clinical sequencing, um, uh, which is quite different to research. So the focus is on reliability, um, not discovery. So we're not interested in finding novel genes, we're interested in finding, reliably finding stuff that we know about uh, and stuff that we can actually do something about, uh, actionable mutations. Um, we need to carefully control for false negatives so we don't miss, miss stuff and also false positives so we don't find stuff that, that's actually not real because we don't want to recommend someone having um, uh, a traumatic therapy if in fact th there's nothing there. So our goal is a robust and clinical defensible process. Um, so as we've heard, there's a whole bunch of tools that we use um, and these, these tools are uh, of highly variable quality. I mean, as a software engineer coming from industry, um, I've been initially absolutely horrified by what goes on from a technical point of view. Um, I'm a bit more um, sanguine about it now, but, but Really, um, there's a lot of, lot of assistance needed from software engineers coming into bioinformatics to clean up um, a lot of the labware that's hanging around that, that really um, shouldn't have escaped out of the lab. So what we need to do is try and make uh, a, a reliable system out of unreliable components because we can't rewrite all this stuff overnight. And the problem also is that this stuff has a very short shelf life. You've got a, um, the te technology is changing so rapidly um, but none of this stuff lasts for very long and then you need to rewrite it again. So uh, one of my missions is to um, take uh, uh, bioinformatics from a, uh, a cottage industry into something a bit more like production IT. So here's the helicopter view of what actually um, we do um, from top to bottom. The sample comes in to the hospital. Um, we register it. Um, someone might have scribbled something about what what the actual patient has wrong with them. Um, that's not always the case, so we don't necessarily know what their, their disease is, what, which is what the phenotype is all about. Uh, we have to prepare that sample. We have to isolate what we want. Um, we have to amplify it up um, and then prepare it in a way that we can then sequence it. So then the yellow boxes in the center there are all the automatic processes that um, um, have been described uh, by previous speakers. So we sequence it, we align the reads to some sort of reference genome, um, and then we try and find out what mutations or variants are in that. Then we annotate those variants to say what they actually are, describe them, and then we have to curate them so that we can report on them to back to the 
pathology lab or the, or the treating clinician. So, and we've got to do all of this in a, in a clinically relevant time frame. And by that, I mean you've got to do it before um, uh, it's useful to the patient. Um, and the blue boxes are, are really the problems that are, exist at the moment and, and what we're trying to, to solve. Um, we're trying to auto flow, or automate the, the workflow, um, wet lab robotics. Um, we're trying to capture the phenotype in a, in a, with a, a nicely defined ontology, um, uh, like describe it accurately, what, what the, the disease the person has rather than just what the doctor um, um, thinks, thinks might be uh, a good description of it. Um, as I said, there's a high churn of disruptive technology, so um, every few, few years a new technology comes out and all the, all the algorithms we've been using may not, no longer be relevant. Uh, where the volume, data volume is increasing all the time, um, and the bottleneck at the moment is that the blue box, second from the bottom there, the curation process, where we need to be able to um, say something sensible about those genes in a clinical context, and that that's that's no mean feat, and there's there's very few people around that can actually do that, and it's a an emerging new profession. Um, another view going from the sequencer through to the clinical report on the right. Um, it's really driven by global databases that we need um, at the top there. Uh, we, the, the, we get about a gigabyte of stuff coming out of the sequencer because we're doing small targeted panels, not, not whole genome stuff, because cancer is very specific to a number of genes. We don't need to look at the whole genome, uh, well, not yet at any rate. Um, and we have to filter all the artifacts out. That's the first step. Um, then we have to work out whether this is a common variant that's, that's common in, in large parts of the population. Anything up above around one, if it appears in more than about 1% of the population, it's probably not disease. It's probably just um, uh, a common variation in, in, in the human, human genome. Then we have to annotate everything um, very carefully to make sure that we, we're fully describing what we're looking at. Um, and we have to throw away the incidental findings, that is stuff that hasn't been asked for, um, and then report on the rest. So um, the system that um, I originally built, but now is, is um, we've, now we've got a team working on it, um, is called Pathos um, for Pathology Operating System. Um, we're up to the 1.1 release finally, um, and we've named them after Game of Thrones characters, as you can see. We're working our way through all the, the houses and we're up to the uh, Tyrells or the Tyrells. Um, so that's the, the next release that we're looking at. So Pathos is a, a, um, a, a web-based application, which I'll go into in a bit, but the, the, what it's trying to deal with is, is problems, problems basically in scalability with the current pathology process. Um, it's just not scalable for the huge volumes of data that um, will happen once we start sequencing every patient and not only sequence every patient that comes through, but also sequence them multiple times during their, um, their encounter with the health system because um, you want to see how they're progressing over time and, and um, uh, their genome is a, a key to that. So the strategy is um, automate everything, basically. Uh, we're trying to automate the, um, the processing all the way through from sequencer to report. Uh, we won't be able to do all of that, but um, we want to at least give the decision support tools to the pathologists and the uh, curators so that they can do their job um, in, a, in a reasonable time frame. Um, here's a, a helicopter view of it. Um, basically, the sample comes in at the, the bottom, uh, goes through the sequencer, goes through a, a pipeline which um, has been talked about. Um, uh, like Bernie, we use um, uh, B pipe as well. Um, We've got a, a validation process called Pipe Cleaner, which, which puts data into the pipeline and checks that what com what's coming out is actually correct. Uh, we then load it into the database, compare it with other data, data and um, generate various uh, web pages that people can process and generate reports from. How am I doing for time, Alan? 10 minutes, okay, thank you. All right, well, I'll... I'll um, I'll skip over that. Um, QC is critical for, for this. Um, we want to see how the run, the, the sequencing run compares with previous um, uh, 
previous runs, we've been running the system now for two years, so we've got a lot of uh, historical data to compare how we're doing. Um, we compare each sample within the run. We run um, 48 samples at a, at a, at a go, um, and we just look at all the quality metrics that come out of that. So a curation page looks something like this, where, where red is bad and um, yellow is uh, benign. Um, we automatically match variants that we've seen before with um, uh, uh, the stuff that's coming off the sequencer, um, and then we can uh, then curate each of those variants individually and run a report for the patient. Uh, and we've also got a fairly sophisticated um, searching variant and filtering process so that we can um, uh, get rid of artifacts and control exactly what everyone's seeing on the screen. And they're templated as well, as you can see from the templated searches down the bottom there. So the goal is to, to have um, uh, all these different metrics to apply to a particular um, uh, variant. We want to know whether it's an artifact, as in is it uh, just a consequence of the technology. Um, we want to know whether it's been seen before in the databases or literature. We want to know whether it's pathogenic or not. And then we want to know whether we can do something about it, as in actionability. And this is our, um, uh, our software list. Um, all of it's um, public domain, except uh, or public, uh, free and openware, um, except for IntelliJ, which you could replace with Eclipse if you wanted to. Um, it's just my preference. Um, and we use it, we make heavy use of the uh, Atlassian suite for that is Jira, Confluence, and Bamboo, because they um, we get them under the uh, uh, not-for-profit community license. So, without us, your doctor's just guessing. So we're trying to improve that. Um, just lastly, I'll just go through a couple of uh, principles I've got for software development. So life is a Pareto distribution. So everyone, um, if you took everyone's uh, income in this room and, and uh, put them from highest to lowest, to draw a graph like this. So a Pareto curve is a, a straight line on a log-log graph. So from a software development point of view, what you want to do is concentrate on the the 20% of features that give you 80% of the benefit. So that's my, my first software development rule. Do those features first, because they're the ones that'll give you maximum bang for buck. Um, obviously, stand on the so shoulders of giants. This, um, this is classic for, for this uh, environment where we're using uh, lots of open source software. Um, and uh, it's debugged stuff. It, it's, it's modular, as, um, uh, as Bernie pointed out. And um, that's how you can look good with the least amount of effort. Um, another rule of mine is don't automate a manual mess. Um, frequently, software engineers get asked to um, come and make automate this. And you look at the this, and it's, um, it's already a mess. And if you implement it, you've just got a computerized mess. So um, you need to push back if, if that's really what they want. Um, Agile's fantastic. Um, rapid prototyping, where you actually build something uh, and try it out as a concept and push it onto um, uh, your subject matter expert and do it as rapidly as possible, uh, is a fantastic way to evolve something very, very quickly. Um, that's me and uh, Andrew Fellows, our, our chief scientist at Peter Mac. Uh, he's my subject matter expert buddy, and um, uh, we we do something like two or three releases a day just to, just to churn through it when we were prototyping it. Um, and this is a media shot where I'm holding a bit of lab equipment. I've got no idea what it is, and he doesn't either, because <laughs> neither of us work in labs, so that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> so I'm a dry lab bioinformatician. Uh, well, all bioinformaticians are dry lab, pretty much. Um, I used to work in the um, telecommunications industry. Uh, I used to be a network engineer, and uh, in my days working for Telstra, we built this system called Magpie. Um, no one asked us to do it. Um, we just thought it was a good idea because we had engineers that were basically um, trawling through 20 different systems that didn't talk to each other. Um, these were all, this was all legacy crap that goes back to the 70s. It was IBM, it was spreadsheets, it was just dreadful. 
Um, and to do a network activation in Telstra, you have to hit all of those different boxes along the way to activate a service. Um, and so it was just a nightmare. And, and you get work tickets that were bounced back and forth because this wasn't ready or that wasn't ready. So I came up with the idea of just doing a read-only extraction of all this data um, on a nightly basis um, and putting it into a spreadsheet. And that was a massive step forward. Um, and then uh, I worked with Nick, um, Nick Kravchenko, and we built this system called uh, Magpie, which was a web face on top of this, the, um, the database that we then put the spreadsheet into. And now it's got 4,000 users, and um, Telstra couldn't survive without it. So, I mean, a couple of takeouts from that was that, um, uh, what did I have in my notes here? Yeah, so it's often, um, if you've got a Gordian knot of systems and you can't actually get rid of them or replace them, it's often easier just to leave them where they are and do a read-only extraction of, of stuff, which you can then stitch up um, and put a web interface over. So um, you could, we could have, this is a problem they've been wrestling with for, for years and they just got absolutely nowhere with it. But um, taking the view of just leave legacy systems as they are and just rip the data out uh, and do it on a periodic basis. It worked wonders. So you don't always have to replace stuff if, uh, um, to get the effect. Um, and the other thing was some of the best products come from where no one's actually asked you to do anything. Um, if, you could, if you can do it, operate as a skunk works, and really bioinformatics is a gigantic skunk works at the moment. You can just do anything you want, um, and you can build it how you want, and um, and do it in a way that's incredibly effective and, and um, helps patients um, or whatever domain that your bioinformatics is in. Um, just as an aside, uh, I had a talk uh, on testing, uh, software testing, um, and um, software testing is something that's, that's been a bit missing in um, bioinformatics, to, in my opinion. It's, it's just not tested sufficiently at all. Um, and so I think that's something that has to be um, built into the whole process of um, uh, bioinformatics going forward. And the problem with testing is that you only test for, for what you're actually uh, expecting to happen or expecting to go wrong. Um, but really what you need is a, a panoply of, of corner cases, um, uh, bad data, good data, um, and just hammer the, the system with it and make sure that it, um, you get positive tests and failing tests and missing tests and everything. Um, less is more, so have a good, a good small team without um, a whole lot of uh, people, get people at the pointy end of the Pareto curve and just a few of them and you cut down the, the, the mesh of interaction that you need for building a team. And finally, integrate early and integrate often. So this works at, at multiple levels. So you want to have the software interacting with um, other software um, you also want people working with other people. So you want to make sure that you can get an end-to-end -end operation running as quickly as possible because that's how you test your architecture, not by just doing unit tests and not by just doing simple integration tests but doing an end-to-end -end system. So briefly, that's, that's the, um, the, the team that I work with. Um, they're all fantastic people. They're all, all incredibly smart. And that's another good thing about bioinformatics. You work with really, really smart people all the time. And uh, I commend you to the profession. Um, any questions? Thanks, Ken. Thank Ken. And I have to thank Ken for being the person who really opened my eyes to what's involved with quality software development when he joined our group. But um, any questions for Ken on, on that? I'll just ask you, Ken, what do you oh. think is the biggest technical challenge you have facing you now? <laughs> uh, I'm getting through my wish list. <laughs> Too many features? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, a lot, there's so many interesting things that we could do, um, but we've sort of, I've sort of bogged myself down with this day-to-day -day operational system, which I've got to keep going. Um, so, um, yeah, but I think, I, think, uh, I think the real next step is to actually, instead of having tabular data, but visualization, I think that's the real key because you can do, um, it's, the, it's the quickest 
um, way to get from the screen into the brain is to visualize something uh, accurately. And, and it's the only way we're going to cope with the, the volume of data that we need to, to, to look at all the, the, the expanding number of genes and the expanding number of mutations is have some, some clever ways of visualizing that so that we can then get to the nub of the problem of whatever um, disease the patient has. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ken.